Don't want anyone to miss anything. <laughs> Okie doke. Well, welcome everyone to this session of AAC in the Cloud with Ashley Laracy and Lauren Sheehan. Ashley is a speech language pathologist and Lauren is a teacher. So we have a great team here talking about AAC and emergent literacy for families and caregivers. And I'll turn it bo to both of you. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna try to share my screen. So Lauren and I are very excited to be here with all of you today talking all things emergent literacy. Let me see if I can get this going. There we go. Um, our presentation today is going to be geared towards um, family members, caretakers. Um, but if you're an educator, if you're a speech language pathologist, if you are someone else that's a stakeholder in an AAC user's life, um, I think you'll still take some things that you can use from this presentation. Um, but just so that you know, going in, you know, a lot of our um, recommendations and things that we're talking about are geared towards families in the home. Um, so just to introduce um, myself, my name is Ashley Laracy. I'm a speech language pathologist. I've been practicing for 12 years. Um, I've worked in a lot of different settings, but most recently I've um, been for the past eight years, I think, in a public high school in the um, Chicagoland area. Very passionate about um, person-centered planning, literacy, AAC, um, and collaborative teaming. Um, and this is my lovely coworker, Lauren Sheehan. I'll let her introduce herself. Hi everyone, my name is Lauren Sheehan. I am a special education teacher. Um, I am um, a wonderful, um, very blessed that I get to work with Ashley on a daily basis all the time. Um, and we're a very dynamic team together. So we're hoping today that we can share with you um, all the tools that we have been using in our class for the past few years, but then also to leverage um, how this can also be very much applied in the home setting and kind of taking the tools that we've really explored a lot to be able to um, really create a powerful change for our learners at home. Um, you'll see at the bottom that we have a bunch of resources um, that are packed into a wakelet. The one at the very top is going to be handouts for, for today. Um, there's so much that goes into emergent literacy that it's hard to kind of jam pack everything into 50 minutes. We're going to do our best. Um, but if there's anything that you want to learn more about or that you um, just want to read up more on, there's going to be tons of that information that's just there in the wakelet. Um, it's in the Slack and then we'll share it at the end as well. Um, so we're making this like a guidebook, right? Um, where could you go if you're wanting to implement emergent literacy in the home? So here you've got your table of contents. This is everything really that we're going to be going over today. So you're going to see in all of these different tabs, all of the different components of literacy instruction for emergent learners. Um, when we say that, um, we're talking about learners who maybe don't know all of their letters yet. Um, maybe they don't actively maybe engage or communicate during shared reading experience. Um, they might not un yet understand that print has meaning so that maybe when I'm writing a letter to someone or that I'm sending a text that that's actually language and that's actually communicating with someone else. Um, so we're looking at there's one more that I'm like blanking on right now, Lauren, it's because I'm on the spot. <laughs> oh, my gosh. So anyway, we're talking about a means of sorry, Ash, I was just yes. gonna say talk about a means of communicating with others, right? You have to have the ability to share what you're thinking when you want to share it. So whether it's via AAC, like we're going to be embedding today, um, or other, um, you know, means that um, a, a learner might use as well. Thanks, Laura. So thinking about AAC specific to this conference, right? Every student, every learner, every adult needs a way to communicate um, and they need a robust communication system. So these are the students that we're talking about, right? So this is just kind of your guidebook, but we're gonna jump into some things that we, um, we think are important just in kind of setting the stage as far as having high expectations for every single learner that we support. Um, the, these are two quotes. Um, the first one's from David Yoder, 
order. The second one is um, from the text, Comprehensive Literacy for All, which we'll share that I think on the next slide. Um, but no student is to anything to be able to read and write. So, you know, as we sit here and we and we talk with you, maybe if maybe you are a teacher, you know, or maybe you're thinking about your child and you're thinking that literacy might not be a good fit or it might not be something that you know your child is able to do we really want to encourage you to change your mindset to say no student is to anything they're not too old not too disabled not too medically complex physically complex no one is to anything and we're hoping to give you some um strategies to support learners who may have more um, higher support needs to be able to access the alphabet, to be able to engage during reading experiences. Um, the second one, you know, Lauren and I both work in a high school um, and, you know, in high school, there's this big focus on functional skills and life skills. And, you know, we believe this in our core is that, you know, literacy is the most functional skill that your students can acquire. Um, you're talking about literacy is embedded in everything. Um, I always like to share this story or this, I guess, thought that I have um, when thinking about the functionality of literacy. You know, reading and writing are means of communication. Um, and those are the ways that we communicate with, pe with people when they are not with us, when they're not I'm not sitting next to Lauren, I'm going to be texting her. Um, I need to reschedule an appointment. I'm going to email, you know, my doctor or something like that. Maybe I'm going to call, but maybe not. Literacy is providing this bridge to be able to communicate with people when you're not with them. And I always say, you know, working in a high school, I work with older learners and the learners who come and they find me on Facebook and they find me on Instagram and they're sending me emails. They're the students who can read and they're the students who can write. And so you know, that connection with other people that literacy provides is truly functional and it's person-centered, it's relationship-based. So I think that no matter what, when we're thinking about these things, you know, literacy truly is the most functional skill that your students can acquire. So this is that text that we're talking about. If you don't have this yet, go run to Amazon or your local bookstore or <laughs> wherever you like to buy your books. Um, this is Comprehensive Literacy for All by Dr. Karen Erickson and Dr. David Copenhaver. They really talk about literacy instruction for those emergent learners that we're talking about today, and then also more conventional learners. So maybe you do have, um, your, your child knows all of their letters and they can engage during shared reading and they have a means of communication. Those students are going to be using more conventional strategies. But for this emergent literacy that we're going to be talking about today, these are the components. These are all the things that we're going to be talking about. So we're going to break these down and how this can look in, in the home setting. And then just tying in this AAC piece, if you haven't seen this YouTube video by Dr. Karen Erickson, it is, I, I, I don't even know how many times I've watched it. Um, it's so powerful. And one of the things that she says is you can't do AAC without literacy. You can't, you can't, because no matter how many words, single words that we could program or how many phrases that we could program into an AAC system, it's never all going to be there. There's going to be a time where some fringe word, some noun, like maybe a favorite restaurant that I like to go to, or a name of a friend that I met at the park. I'm not going to be able to communicate any of those things if I don't have the ability to write with letters, with or the orthography. So I'm using letters to write um, and reading and writing. So just thinking about that um, as we kind of set the stage here, um, you really can't do AAC without literacy. All right, I'll let you jump in. All right, sounds good. All right, so as we progress here, you'll see in our guidebook that we will be breaking down all the emo um, components of emergent literacy here. Um, and as we progress through that, what we're going to do is we're going to share the component with you. We're also going to share a QR code that gives um, just additional links to a wonderful resource. Um, and most of our links are um, from the wonderful folks at UNC. Um, and then from there, we'll talk about what is it, we'll define it a little bit. We'll talk about how you can do the strategy and then share examples with you um, for home use. So um, just kind of a disclaimer there. There's so much that goes into all of these different components that we really suggest that you explore more of these resources that we share with you because um, like Ms. Laracy shared, we only have so much time to really dive in. So um, we'll get started here. So shared reading. Shared reading is um, 
I think my favorite um, component, uh, um, actually, it's one of my favorite, actually, I love all the components, what am I saying? Um, but I think it's definitely one of my favorite components, because it's truly um, an interaction and engagement with students or with our learners or with your child at home. Um, it's really an interactive reading experience between an adult um, and a learner or adult and a child, an adult and another adult, maybe. Um, it really builds on interactions with one another. Another. Um, we focus on language. We're working on print awareness. Shared reading is really great for students who um, are need support in the engagement process of what reading is. That we sit and we're looking at books or we're looking at an email or whatever the text might be. Um, it has structured and unstructured approaches with it as well. So two of the structured um, approaches to shared reading are um, acronyms. The first one is CAR and the second Second one is crowd in the car. Um, we're not going to dive into those specifically today, but definitely, um, you know, check out the resources that we share so you can get familiar with both of them. Um, and then there's unstructured where you don't necessarily have to follow um, a set of um, commenting or asking. It can kind of be a little bit more fluid process. Um, and it's really inviting the learner to participate, but not necessarily require participation in a reading exchange. So how can you do this? So, um, you know, select a text that's a really high interest topic of your um, of your child, whether that be something that they want to read all the time, whether it be a topic that they like, a category of food, whatever it might be. Um, and we'll show you where you can get some of those texts from as well. Um, you're going to then decide whether you want this to be a structured or an unstructured approach or experience. Um, if you do select a structured approach, um, one is called CAR, so that um, I'm going to read the text with a student or with a learner. I'm then going to comment. What do I see? I'm going to ask for participation, but not require them to participate. And we'll talk about that. And then I'll respond to their attempts. So somebody could be reading something and you can point to a picture and you can say just the word look, because you're pointing to what you see and you're modeling on an AAC device and you're waiting, you're providing that wait time. And maybe all your child does is just nod their head and smile. And you could say, yeah, turtle. And you're engaging. So again, I'm not drilling with questions. I'm not requiring an, um, a certain level of communication back. It's an interactive back and forth process. So let's kind of take a look at some examples here of what that can look like. So when we look at our first few, here are some just print-based books that you might have at your house. So um, a topic of you might have an emergent reader that likes Barbie, that likes um, Star Wars, that likes construction, that likes whatever it might be, grab a book or a text from your house. Um, and you're, you're pointing to pictures as you go along. I might be modeling the words like, oh no, because this text here is, um, the hot dogs are hot, hot for Barbie and her friends. And I'm working on then modeling on my device to find feel and then hot as well too. Or down at the bottom, I'm focusing on some print referencing here. I'm identifying some uppercase letters that I'm seeing and I'm bringing attention to that for my learner. I'm saying, look, uppercase G, and I'm pointing and I'm highlighting that as I'm reading and interacting. And then maybe I'm opening up the keyboard on the device and I'm finding uppercase G. So um, our AAC use and our shared reading really goes hand in hand here. And it's, it's almost like the perfect pair, I feel, because it's providing that language support, providing aided language with our learners and our children, and also being able to work on literacy and engagement in reading. So just some tools that can use are any books or texts or any materials that you have at your house, and then grab your AAC device as well. Um, some technology examples that we have here are just from um, open source website. So Tar Heel Reader is um, fantastic. They have two different versions. They have shared Tar Heel Reader, which is specific to shared reading. Um, here's an example of we're reading a book about a dog because I have a dog at my house or my emergent learner has a dog at their home and they love talking about their dog and sharing that with people. Wonderful. Let's pick that and let's read about it. So here we have an example of a free book on shared Tar Heel Reader. And that's a source or a resource that we share with you on our website as well. Um, and down at the bottom, you'll notice 
just says there's some symbolic communication supports there. Um, so you can either click that on the screen, you can have your AAC device with you as well. And Share Tar Heel Reader is wonderful because it provides you some tools like the symbolic communication on the page. Um, it could be switch accessible if you have a student that needs alternative access as well too. Um, Plus it supports the reader by giving you examples of comments that you can make. So here you might say something like, he likes to swim or he likes that. Um, and then down at the bottom here, we have an example of Unite for Literacy is another free website, or you can download their app, their Unite app. Um, and you can look up books of a lot of different topics there too. Um, sometimes, um, you know, you might be looking for something a little bit more unique in your topics. So these two are really good, great, great resources to look for that. Um, and then down at the bottom, you might see some more text, um, like in our Unite for Literacy example here, you see some repetitive text. I see eagles up in a tree. And the next page is, I see house up in a tree. Just looking at that, there's a lot of repetitive text. There's core words, great way to model this on devices as well too. And any tools that you need to access this is whatever you might have, iPad, smartphone, tablet. Um, I've pulled up books on my phone sometimes um, when we're waiting for a late bus and I'm like, okay, great, let's sit down and we're gonna read a, we're gonna read a book about waiting or being late or a bus or what are you having for dinner tonight? Oh, you wanna read about you know, tacos, let's find a book about it. Um, so they're super friendly to access as well. So um, any way that you can embed that into your day um, at home is wonderful. So we'll go on and we'll share a few other ideas that we have. Oh, those are just some examples there of, you know, what you could say then to make some comments when you're reading along. Sorry, Laura, somebody should fire this. That's okay. <laughs> I still like you, so it's all good. Um, so just some additional ideas. You really have to keep this fun. Shared reading is about an interaction. It's not to feel like I'm sitting down with a caretaker, a family member, and I have work that I have to do. Um, we talk, we're gonna talk about some repetition with variety. You read the same book a lot. That's wonderful. And each time you read it, focus on something different. Talk about print talk about the language, make different comments. Um, it's, like I said, perfect time for aided language. So many other materials you can use. Um, you can even draw your own pictures and write your own books. I mean, even in school, I mean, I've written, you know, if you don't have a book about Justin Bieber, then you can get a pen or a piece of paper and you can write your own book. You can write some simple sentences. He likes to dance. He likes to sing. All these simple things that you can write and draw your own pictures, whatever it might be. So, so many different ways that you can get books that we share here. Um, so just, just think there's a lot of possibilities when it comes to shared reading. And kind of talking about reading still, we're going to move on and talk about independent reading. <clears throat> Oops. That's all right. So I'm going to start talking about independent reading here real quick. <clears throat> so on, in, sorry, hold on. That's okay. No big deal. <sighs> sorry about that. Okay. So independent reading, while Miss Laracy opens that up, we'll kind of start. Yeah, let me see if I can fix this. Sorry. No problem. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So the resource that we share with you on independent reading comes from, um, again, our folks at UNC, and it's a project core module. Um, we know that emergent literacy learners are not net yet independently reading with comprehension. Um, and that's okay, because that should not stop us from still providing materials for them to engage and read with. So what is independent reading? It, it really is a time for a learner or a child, a student to browse reading choices to read and let them just read and explore them independently. Um, we should have fiction and nonfiction and stuff in print and materials electronically as well too. We need to have options that have both text or text with pictures or just pictures which are wordless books as well. Um, how you can do this at your house. How do I provide independent reading time for my child who's not yet reading and maybe doesn't know my letters or doesn't have um, a great shared reading experience. And that's okay. We still need to provide them with a variety of choices. And the more you do and model independent reading at your house and your family members are doing that, you will see that your learner does recognize that. Um, read to your learner. Your learner can sit there and 
and listen to you as you're reading a text or as you're reading a book, or maybe as you're reading the sales ad, yes, can't wait to go grocery shopping. Let's look at this. Let's read what, what's, um, you know, on sale today at this store, whatever it might be. Um, and use both print-based and technology resources as well too. So let's take a look at some examples here then. Um, again, check out that QR code that we share, but some print-based texts that you have at home, magazines, grocery store ads, cookbooks, pamphlets, mail flyers, whatever it might be. Um, these are just some examples from emergent learners in their house of, you know, uh, you might have a brother or sister that's interested, or you are getting magazines. Share that with your child. Um, open up the cookbook and look at the pictures and make comments and reference, oh, if I'm going to make pumpkin bread, you know, you can reference a lot of different things, um, that they might be looking at, make comments while they're doing it, but let them explore and look at the book on their own. Um, and any tools is just any printed materials that can gain attention and interest of your child as well. Um, some, uh, some other ideas that we have, some electronic ideas I, I have, we should say, um, are YouTube videos. So these are great. You can find so many books um, on YouTube that are read by authors or read by other people just reading books. And it's simultaneously turning the pages. Um, if they don't have text on there, you can add closed captioning. It's a wonderful resource that's um, on most, most um, videos, TV shows, whatever you might have to. So turn that on. So um, I have a, you know, I have a learner that really likes planets. Well, the National Geographic books are all on YouTube and they're all read by great, great authors or great, um, you know, people that are just reading books. And it's wonderful. You can increase or slow down the rate of speech when you're reading the book. Um, I also have another learner, like I showed previously, the book about the dog. Well, likes to watch dog videos. Wonderful. The dog videos don't have text on the screen, so I'm going to turn on closed captioning. I'm going to provide that print awareness while they're maybe watching that. And I would suggest more of those videos and TV shows for more of our students that are maybe struggling to show engagement with, with reading, with shared reading. I wouldn't necessarily do it all the time for um, somebody who is very engaged in the reading process. I mean, you can, I'm not saying that it's not a great idea of, well, it's a great accessibility tool. Um, but if we're really trying to focus on increasing some of the literacy skills, then do that for students that you're having a hard time um, or children that are having a hard time engaging in the reading process with you at home. So just a few other thoughts about independent reading for you. Um, look at other examples like websites, pull up their high interest websites and let them just scroll and explore the website. Look at social media for older learners. Again, you know, take that with, um, with what you want in terms of, um, you know, um, let's just say privacy accessibility on that end. Um, but that's great because like, like Ashley shared, we do have a lot of older learners that are on social media. So let's look at notes in mails and letters or lists. Um, let them read your old grocery list that you have. Let them read mail that comes for you or other people or them in the mail. Um, keep it fun. Um, there's We share a fun reading tracker. If you want to embed, um, everybody is going to be able to read so many books and let's, um, you know, just any way to kind of light, liven up um, the exchange that your child has with independent reading and then also um, celebrating success when it comes with that too. Um, just a few other things that you want to think about, um, providing choices that could be accessible at any time. So how are you going to organize that? Um, probably the majority of us just don't want stacks and stacks of reading material, but maybe you do. And that's great. Maybe you think about books and going in bins or baskets. Maybe you have different folders that you want to use. Um, uh, another strategy is, you know, sharing shortcuts to your iPad or your tablet, where that can be um, readily accessible on your homepage there. So there's an example of, we have, um, an example of a folder on an iPad there that says reading choices. So you just drag and drop all of those shortcuts on there of quick links that they can just click, um, you know, tag your favorite books on um, Tar Heel Reader as well too. So a lot of different options that you can do in order to get quick access to independent reading choices for your child at home.
All right. I'm going to let Ashley jump in here on shared reading. Okay. There we go. Hello. <laughs> Sorry. I was on mute. Um, I'm going to jump into shared writing. Um, I don't know if we mentioned this at the beginning, but these QR codes that you're going to see at the top of each of these um, topics here, these are linking to modules that are offered through Project Core. Um, Project Core is an amazing initiative out of UNC. And I think that sometimes when people think of Project Core, they think of um, core vocabulary and core language for AAC. And there are a lot of resources um, regarding AAC and communication on that website. However, there are also modules for every single component of emergent literacy instruction that we're talking about today. Um, I wanna say they're short, they're like 15 to 20 minutes. They're very, very user-friendly. Um, you can take them, um, they just link right to YouTube videos. Um, you can take them for credit or for like quizzes and get like certificates if you want to do that. But all these things that we're talking about today, it's hard to dive, really break them down in the short amount of time that we have. So if there's there's something where you're like, oh, you know what? I want more information about shared writing. You're just, this is where you can go. And those project core modules are linked in the wakelet. So there, it's just one link and you'll see all those modules there. Okay. So shared writing, shared writing is um, really, a, it's a shared writing experience between um, a learner and, you know, another person, maybe a facilitator. It might be me, it might be a parent, might be a sibling. Um, and it, it's fun when you do it in a large group and we'll talk about some ways to do that. Sometimes that might be hard at home if it's just you and a, you know, a child or an adult, an older learner, um, there's ways to bring in other people. But it's a structured writing activity where learners contribute their own ideas about whatever your writing topic is. Um, so I would model the writing and you use a really consistent sentence stem throughout. So I'm gonna say, okay, I, I like to eat brownies and brownies is going to be my fill in word. I'm going to say, Laura, Lauren, what do you like to eat? Oh, she's answering in the slack. Lauren, what do you like to eat? Oh, sorry. Yes, I was. <laughs> I love tacos. You love tacos. Yes. Love Throw them. in the slack. What do you like to eat? Throw in the slack, pick your favorite food. What do you like to eat? Okay. And those are going to be the learner contributions to this activity. It's whatever that ending kind of word is. Um, this helps learners understand that print has meaning. They can see that language being modeled by the instructor. They can see it being transcribed into writing. And it's really a five-step process. I want to look over here. Pizza, Joanna. I want to have pizza for dinner. <laughs> Cheesecake, that's a good one too. So for what you're going to do on this is you're going to write the chart together. So day one, I'm going to write the chart. We're going to fill in all those ending phrases. You guys have a lot of, you guys are making me hungry. Um, day two, you're going to reread the chart together and you're going to focus on something specific. We'll talk about this in a minute. Um, day three, you're going to cut up the sentences. This helps develop concept of word, right? That I have this big, long chunk that's a sentence, but it's composed of several different words. It's helping us understand word boundaries and how words go in a certain order in order to make sense. Um, and then days four and five, be the sentence and write the book. But I'm going to go ahead and jump in. Um, if you want to learn more about this, again, those project core modules, predictable chart writing is this what we're talking about right now. Um, there's other forms of shared writing as well, too. Um, but shared writing in the form of predictable chart writing is what we're going to talk about right now. So if you're at home and you're thinking, okay, I want to write, I want to do a predictable chart about an experience. This is so helpful on on and on a lot of different fronts um you know you as a caregiver you have many different experiences with your child that educators don't get to be part of at home you do fun things on the weekend maybe you go to a restaurant maybe you're hanging out with family members and I know that, you know, sitting in many, many IEP meetings, I hear from parents quite frequently, you know, we don't know what they did at school. And it's kind of vice versa, right? Like I have a student who might come in and I might say, oh, tell me about what you did over the weekend. And they might not be able to tell me. But if you're doing this predictable chart and I can say, oh, you know what? I saw that Alana went to the beach this weekend and I saw that Alana liked the water. And the, uh, these parentheses at the end, this is everybody who contributed to this kind of um, 
um, predictable chart. So it can be people in the family. Maybe it's going to be a neighbor. Maybe it's going to be, I'm going to call grandma and ask her what she likes about the beach. So again, focusing right now just on experiences. Um, what you can do for writing these charts, um, it's often helpful to anchor it to some sort of visual. So maybe when I'm at the beach, I know, okay, we're going to get home and we're going to write day one of predictable chart. We're going to write the chart. I'm going to take some pictures of us at the beach. So maybe we're building sandcastles and we're playing and, you know, we're splashing in the water. So I'm going to have all of that up here. Um, another thing that I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be doing a ton of modeling on the AAC device. So here you can see I have a lot of different things like sticks and rocks and sand and water and things that I might see at the beach. So maybe a learner has a difficult time kind of determining like, well, what did I like about the beach? Providing that robust AEC system with all of these different options is almost providing a choice board of some different things like what are some things that you remember, what are some things that you liked, you could also use the picture in this, you know, in this way too to help kind of provide some choices there. Um, so that's day one. And then you go through day two, day three, day four, which we aren't going to talk about. But day five is where you're going to write the book. Oh, I just want to go back here one second. You're going to see all you need for this is paper, markers, pictures, and a device. That's it. Super easy. Okay, let me go back. Uh oh. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Okay. So day five, you're going to make the book together. Now, what's really nice about this making the book is this gives the learner the opportunity to be an author. They get It gives them the opportunity to see this is something that I talked about. I went through these different days where I was working on this. And now I made this book and the book can be a paper book. So maybe they're making these kind of individual pages on pieces of paper and you just, you know, paper clip or um, staple them together and it's just a simple paper book. It can be an ebook. So this is going to be an example of book creator. Book creator is amazing, amazing, amazing for digital books, for creating custom digital books. So I'll just show you this is this is um, Alana's book for the beach. Okay. And you can see you, if you look here at the top, it says read to me. So maybe I, maybe this is something that Alana wants to read during independent reading time. What's really nice about these books too, is oftentimes say I had, say this was a picture of Alana at the beach. I mean, how many of us have students who love to see themselves represented in materials or represented in text? And I think that's really, really important to see learners seeing themselves represented in the materials and things that we're using. So that can be a really great way to increase motivation, you know, and engagement um, in wanting to read. So I'm going to just say, okay, I'm going to read this book. The Beach. I liked the water. I'm going to stop reading. You can see what's happening there is I'm getting highlighting word for word that's paired with that verbal output. That's going to be super, super helpful for independent reading time where, you know, a student can go and sit and do that and not have to have an adult there helping to facilitate. Of course, we can do that, but we don't need to. I liked the water. I liked the sand. I and you can set this up so that it turns the pages on its own, um, that it turns the pages, um, you know, with a, the click of a button. Um, you can set this up for switch accessibility. So if you have a, you're working with a child or have a student who um, uses switches to communicate, that you could set this up for switch access. So lots of different things that you can do here um, for for that. Oh boy. Okay. Okay, another thing that you could do here with shared writing at home is maybe you do experience charts. You could also do menu planning. So menu planning could be, um, we, we're gonna figure out what we're gonna have this week for dinner and everybody gets to have a choice and somebody's gonna pick cheesecake and somebody's, I, I've got all the choices over here on my Slack of all the things that we're eating for dinner. But here uh, we're gonna say, okay, Omar says, I want to eat tacos. And then we're going to ask Amir. And then we're going to ask Noor. And everybody's going to have something that they can pick. And this can be part of that family menu. Maybe then we make our grocery list and we take that to the store to buy the different ingredients for some of these things. So again, day one is where we made that chart. And then day two is where we're going to be rereading the chart. And when we reread it, we're focusing on a specific um, print concept. So for this, for this example, 
couple were um, working on finding those upper and lower case eyes. Okay. Now for some learners, maybe that's something that they can do. Maybe it isn't something that they, maybe they don't know that letter I, maybe they need a lot of help with that. That's great. We can model that. I can look through the different letters and say, oh, I see an I, that's an uppercase I. You see that I'm targeting here also upper and lowercase. Um, that's really important. It's important to target those um, we're looking at those together and talking about the differences. Sometimes you might work with students where they've developed understanding of all of the uppercase letters, but don't know any of the lowercase letters, or they don't understand that that lowercase I is the same as that uppercase I it just has a different representation in writing. Um, so that's just a different way that we could work on that. You can make this really fun. You can use things like fly swatters. You can use, uh, we like these big pointers down here. We've got these everywhere. Um, you can get these at the Dollar Tree, cheap, you know, cheap stores. And again, I'm modeling, you know, on, on an AAC device. Cause I'm, I'm just wanting to demonstrate this. It's not something that I'm making the child do. Um, but it's just, you know, another way that I can provide kind of a visual support here. Um, again, all you need paper marker, AAC device and a pointer. Um, and you can you can do lots of different things. Maybe you're finding all of the instances of the word want. Maybe you're finding all of the spaces between the words. Maybe you're finding the capital letters or the periods. There's lots of different concepts of print that you could work on. But this this, I think, is really important, um, an important step in predictable chart writing. Um, and then day three, this would be an example of that cut up sentences thought. Um, for this step, what you're going to do is you're going to give, you know, your child or the learner um, a strip of a piece of paper with all of those, uh, I want to eat tacos, right? And first they're gonna cut apart those word boundaries. So they're gonna cut in between the words. Now, I don't know if you can see here on tacos, tacos has maybe like five cuts in it. The key thing here is I'm not, I'm letting them make mistakes. It's okay to make mistakes. I think that many of us support learners who have become very, very prompt dependent because anytime that they're about to do something wrong, we jump in and we say, oh, don't do that. Don't do that. We, we want it to, it's okay to make mistakes. It's totally okay to make mistakes. So let them make mistakes. If they cut in between the word boundary, be like, oh, that's ta Cos. Oh, those need to go together. Let's try that again and tape it up and do it again. It's okay. You can also model making mistakes yourself. So maybe Omar had, I want to eat tacos. And maybe I had, I want to eat cheesecake. I can model making mistakes like, oh my gosh, I just cut apart cheesecake. I got, I got to fix that. I got to get my tape because it's okay. It's okay to make mistakes. Um, so you can see here, once we've cut apart these word boundaries, we're gonna reorganize that sentence to put it in the right order. Um, and this might take some time. It might take some practice. Maybe it said tacos want to eat I. And we listen to that and we say tacos want to eat I. Does that make sense? No, that doesn't make sense. I don't understand. Try it again, mix things up and try it again. Um, if you're working with learners who are much more emergent in this skill, do like three word sentences. Like I like tacos instead of I like to eat tacos. You can make this and build this up as you kind of go along. It can be really short kind of sentences at first. Um, if you're working with learners who do use switches, all you can do is move your finger along that and have them hit their switch when they're ready for you to cut. And then you cut it for them. So again, we're thinking about accessibility. We're not saying like, oh, you can't participate in this because you can't use scissors. We're gonna find a way to make this work. Um, you can write charts for anything. You can write charts for um, what, what's your favorite, your favorite movie, your favorite character. And you can think about other words besides nouns too. So maybe I'm um, talking about describing. So maybe instead of when we went to the beach, maybe instead of saying, I liked the sand or I liked the sun, maybe we're filling it in with a describing word. Like it was hot, it was wet, it was dirty. Um, planning, like trips, like what should I bring? Um, when you are doing this in the home, you can put the chart somewhere that's easy for you to reference because you kind of want to point it out throughout the day. Um, if, you're, if your sentences or your sentence stem was I like, you know, maybe you're talking about something and say, oh, you know, Lauren, I want to tell you about the best part of work today. I liked, and I could still point and kind of reference that word. It doesn't have to be this elaborate thing where I'm going over the chart, but I still want to bring awareness to that print and the connections between, um, you know, the language. Um, 
Oh, again, need more people. I kind of already mentioned that you can phone a friend, um, you know, make it, make it a kind of social opportunity, um, for the child where they can, um, they can ask questions to other people and see what it is that they like. Um, we're going to jump into independent writing. So again, that QR code is going to link to Project Core, which is the independent writing module. Um, I think personally, this is one I think that people have the hardest time wrapping their heads around, but I think it's one of the ones that's the most important. Um, it's free writing, okay? So I think that when we think about independent writing, the most important thing to think about here is that a learner has access to the full alphabet. So they're writing with letters um, and that they have something to write on. So that might be a computer screen. It might be, um, it might even be the refrigerator that they're putting magnets on the surface of the refrigerator, but all they need is, you know, letters, um, and something, something to put them on something to make it so that it, there's something that's produced there. Um, for learners that don't, or maybe, um, have fine motor difficulties with using a pencil, we're going to be looking at something that's an alternative pencil. An alternative pencil it can be, it can be lots of different things. There's three examples down here. Um, here's just a keyboard. Um, this is a alternative pencil with four letters at a time. That's a flip book that um, a, um, a communication partner can flip through to indicate certain letters um, or the child can flip through um, if they have the ability to do that. These are just simple, simple letter magnets. Um, I also think one thing with alternative pencils is I don't, they, they don't have to be consistent. You know, I, when I think about myself, I use a keyboard, I use the texting, you know, on my phone, I use that keyboard. Um, so there's, there's different kinds of alternative pencils that you can use. Um, for AAC users, oftentimes their alternative pencil can be that, that keyboard within the AAC system. So that's one of, you know, one of the components of making sure that a communication system is truly robust. Um, one of those components is making sure that it has a keyboard. Um, so that's just something to think about, you know, making sure that um, an AAC system does have access to that or access to the full alphabet. Um, how do we do it? Your learner is going to choose a writing topic, so whatever it is that they want to write about. Again, it's great if you can anchor it with some sort of photo, um, a picture, something that they like. Let them write and encourage them to write more. Um, this is building on more conventional skills where we're talking about um, editing. One of the greatest things that you can do when editing your work is by addition, by adding more things. So we're just gonna let them write and encourage them to write more. Um, if they're able to ask them to tell you about what they wrote and then celebrate. Okay, we're not trying to fix things. We're not trying to point out mistakes. We're celebrating, we're happy, we're proud. Put it up on the fridge send it to your friends, you know, be, be proud and celebrate whatever it is that they gave you. So we're going to look at what this looks like. Um, and the home, you could do writing notes. Um, this could be as simple as telling somebody where you're going, like, oh, I got to tell, we got to tell dad, we're going to the pool. We'll be back soon. Um, writing a note to a family member, writing down a reminder again, like, um, you know, Lauren mentioned earlier, writing a grocery list. So this on the left, this is an example of emergent writing. Um, so writing a note to say, we went to the pool, we'll be back soon. Um, one of the things with emergent writing, again, is we want we want learners to be really proud of their work. Um, and so um, one of the things that we can do, you know, if a learner tells us, you know, I wrote that we're going to the pool and we're going to be back soon. Maybe I'm just going to discreetly write what that message was on the back of the post-it note. Um, I just would be cautious with this. You don't ever want the child or the learner to think that your writing is superior to theirs. Okay. So if you ever notice if it's, if it's, they're noticing things like that. You want to kind of find another way to convey that meaning to others because you don't want them, again, we want them to be proud. We want them to feel, you know, pride in their work. So there's, if there's other ways that you can discreetly do that. Maybe I text dad and I say, Hey, you know, such and so left a note. He said, you know, we're going to the pool. We're going to be back soon. Um, so this is one way to do that. And again, publishing this. So I'm going to leave that note on the fridge. Um, I'm going to put this, put this somewhere where other people can see it. It's not just something that's like, oh, great. Thanks for doing that. Now we're going to throw that in the garbage. Make sure that it really has um, some meaning there. This, you can use any pencil, any surface. Uh-oh. 
Okay, a second one would be writing cards. This is something I think people do all the time as we write cards. So for independent writing, again, we're providing access to the full alphabet so that learners can write with individual letters. So this is an example of a card um, that was created on Canva. Um, if no one's familiar with Canva, it's C-A-N-V-A.com. Um, it's a really cool website that you can use to just create it's actually, it has a lot of different features, but one of the things you can do on it is find different greeting cards and print them out. So we, we went and we looked, this is the card that we're going to get. And then what do you do when you get cards? When I send a card to a family member, usually everybody takes a turn to sign it. So I'm going to give the learner an opportunity to sign the card and they're using their alternative pencil, which is this keyboard right here to type this message. Wonderful. I love it. Okay, now I'm going to write my message underneath. Mine's different. I'm going to say something too, and then I'm going to send this. And that's it. You know, we're celebrating the writing. We want them to be really proud. As we're moving forward, we're working on all of these different other components. It's important to really look at these independent writing samples and observe changes that we might see over time. Do we see things like capital letters? Do we see word spacing emerging? Um, do we see there's focus on a certain letter? Um, do we see that the alternative pencil really is isn't working. Um, but again, thinking we really have to give students time to kind of develop these skills. We think about, you know, um, a child that's, you know, just learning how to hold a pencil. There's a long time that kind of goes through before they're able to do anything with like letter formation and, you know, stringing words together years, years and years of time. And for many of our learners, they've never even been given the opportunity to play around with the alphabet. So let them play, let them write and, you know, make progress. Progress comes over time. Um, additional ideas, some things that you could do, you could write labels for things around the home, like gardening, texting and social media. Again, we kind of had talked about that. Um, experience writing, anything that's their choice. Again, we don't want to force, this is independent writing. We don't want to be forcing them to do things that they don't want to do. And maybe it starts with one letter that is okay. It might start with one letter work up and build over time. Just remember that key thing, you know, we're doing independent writing. This is part of emergent literacy instruction. It does need to be a component of this learner's, you know, the instruction that they receive. All they need is the alphabet and something to write on. Okay, I'm gonna try to fly through here. Alphabet knowledge and phonological awareness. Um, we're talking about these as two kind of um, separate concepts that are gonna go together. Um, I have alphabet knowledge kind of explained here and then phonological awareness explained um, on the right-hand side. Um, the way that we work on these is that we're using both explicit and embedded teaching. Um, explicit instruction is gonna be really short and it's gonna be really brief, like maybe 10 minutes. Um, it's gonna be the same routine kind of every day. Um, and then embedded is gonna be ways that you can point things on you know, through throughout the day, way that we can bring awareness to some of these different things throughout the day. Um, we're not gonna talk about explicit instruction. There's a link in the wakelet that talks about explicit instruction. Um, we're gonna be focusing more on embedded because it's more, it fits more into the home. Um, so homemade alphabet books is one thing that you can do. So, um, you know, there's a lot of alphabet books for younger learners, um, you know, where they have a letter and there's like, there's an apple and an alligator and lots of these different things, but that doesn't mean that we don't still sometimes support learners who are a little bit older, who may still benefit from having, you know, an alphabet book. That's great. Let them choose the pictures. Um, so here we've got um, Homer buying groceries, a dog that's bouncing, and Cookie Monster who's baking cookies. This was actually an actions alphabet book. So um, it, all of those words, all of those words are, it, there's some language kind of embedded there. This is just a simple book that's created in Google Slides and then some pictures that we found online. So very, very easy to do. Um, Letter scavenger hunts. Um, this is another thing that you can do. Um, a highlighting something like a letter of the day. Um, the research tells us that, you know, when we're doing instruction in um, alphabet knowledge and phonological awareness, that we need to be, or alphabet knowledge, we need to be focusing on a letter of the day, not a letter of the week, really focusing on a letter of the day. There's a specific um, scope and sequence that you can go through for that. Um, but you're going to see maybe how many times can I find this letter? And that would be more of that alphabet knowledge. And then on the right hand side, I see a picture of a panda and you see that I don't have the P there. That's more of understanding that sound. I'm understanding that P represents panda. Um, this is just a little um, tool from lesson picks, which we'll go over here in just a minute. 
but there's lots of things that you can do with this. You can do games, um, listening for words that rhyme, pointing out alliteration, um, names, names is a big one. If you can put your child's name and your name in different places in the home, um, some of the earliest letters that are acquired by learners are the letters in their own name. So maybe you're lettering or you're labeling their name where their coat goes or their backpack or their toothbrush, just so they get repetitive exposure with seeing, with seeing their name. That's really going to help. All right, so let's kind of transition. We went over the five areas of emergent literacy and let's talk about some commonly asked questions that we get. So um, a lot of times people are like, where do I get supplies in order to do this? Well, we wanna just share with you that you don't need a lot of expensive tools. You don't need to go and spend hundreds of dollars of things. You already have a lot of things in your home or if you're really interested in going to purchase things, you can get things for cheap. So think about all the things that you can do with a packet index cards. You can write letters on there. You can write words. You can label things. You can make lists. You can write notes and give it to people. Um, if you don't have some of writing supplies, grab a bin at your local discount store and go spend 10 bucks and you can buy a lot of different things that can support emergent literacy in your home. Um, maybe you grab some notebooks because you want Want to keep some independent writing. You, um, everybody, I, I know sometimes I keep a journal at my house. So maybe a learner wants to be able to journal with a parent, go grab some of those fun things and invite the learner along with you. Um, I know from my own experience with my own children, they like when I invite them along to pick out different things that they like and do the same thing here. So um, there's lots of possibilities and you don't really have to spend much money or any money at all, really. Um, let's kind of talk about another area where you can get some resources. So on the next slide, we're going to share um, just that QR code again of our Wakelet. Um, and it's also been dropped in the Slack a few times. Um, Ash, do you mind going to the next slide there real quick if you can? Sorry, thanks. I know you're managing that, so thank you. Um, so just a few things that we do have posted in there. Um, we have some occluders that you can use. Um, those are just, you can print them out either on normal paper, cardstock paper, laminate if you have it. If you don't have it, that's okay too. Cut them out. And you can use those to identify different um, language icons on a device. You can target different letters in print. You can look um, and you can just have some fun scavenger hunts that we talked about for letters with those. Um, we have a free set of alphabet cards for you that you're able to download and print as well. And just some fun reading charts. Maybe you want to track how much you're reading. Um, I know at my house, we track how much time we spend outside. You can track how many books you read, what types of books you read. Um, rating scales are really fun to do too. Did you really like that book? Did you like that cookbook about the tacos that we that we made? Maybe so, maybe not. Um, and then Ashley also talked about um, one of the examples she shared were from Lesson Picks. Um, Lesson Picks is a hands down wonderful, wonderful resource. Um, it is so incredibly affordable as well too. Um, and you can have your own account as a parent. You don't have to be a teacher in order to use this um, to order you to use lesson picks, um, a lot of custom made learning materials. So maybe you want to make an alphabet book. Maybe you want to make a chart that talks about um, the different letters that you've read, or maybe you want to go on there and you want to write your own, um, you know, topics, whether it be lists or scavenger hunt. Um, the, really, the possibilities are endless when you come to creating some custom materials for your child. And then we're also going to talk about we get um, a lot of questions of like, how do I know, is it working, right? Like, how do I know what I'm doing at my house is really going to be beneficial? Or even as an educator, how do I know that this is really mattering? So on the next slide, we have a few questions here that um, sometimes we just take a look at too. Um, Ash, do you mind going to the next slide there? Thanks. Um, so are your children more engaged during reading? Do you see that they're more aware of print in your home? Um, are they more successful when they're identifying letters and letter sound relationships with each other? Um, are they more excited to be able to go grab a book to read at their home or grab a sales ad or to grab a pamphlet from a video game that they like and they're opening it up and they're exploring? Or maybe you see them that they want, um, that they've turned on the closed captioning on their own on their um, devices. Are they more interested in writing? Do you see them grab 
grabbing a pen or a marker or a keyboard and they're typing or they're trying to write to the best of their ability. Um, all of those questions that you might be asking, yes, it's working. If you're seeing all of those things happen and we can go on and on with um, different examples and different questions that people ask too. Um, but what you are doing is making an impact and it does matter. So um, we just kind of want to end with this slide here. Um, and we just, um, Ashley and I actually got asked this question not too long ago, and it really kind of stumped us, but um, it also made us think about, you know what, th this is real. This is really questions that how does a parent get an education staff to be on board to implement this because maybe your child is going um, to school and they're not doing much literacy instruction or they're doing literacy and you're wondering um you know how you can kind of fit in your input to there and we really just have a list of ideas for you here so please don't be afraid as a parent to send pictures and videos and email samples of what you might be doing at home ask for help from others or ask for help um, because maybe the more you dialogue about this with your child's education team the more you'll realize that they are doing it and oh i didn't realize that you were doing this explicit this explicit alphabet um, instruction. And what letter are you on today? Great, because at home tonight, I can do it tonight at home too. Share resources, tell them about the book, share the Loma podcast with them. That's a wonderful podcast that has a ton. They just did a huge, um, Kim runs the Loma podcast and she just did a huge literacy series not too long ago. Um, Jane Farrell, her website is a huge tool, um, not only for educators, but for families as well. Um, get involved in more of the learner centered IE planning process. Um, talk about specific literacy goals that you have for your child and how important that is and how to, how important it is to have the learner be part of that too. Um, include more members of the school district. If you're feeling like you're still hitting that wall, um, talk to more members of administration, keep voicing, and don't be afraid to be the strongest advocate um, for your child, especially when it comes to literacy and instruction. So we're hoping that today, going through the components of literacy, um, emergent literacy instruction, sharing with you some tools that you can use at your house. Um, we try to really focus on um, free and fun things that you can do at your house um, and, and something that doesn't have to be um, one more thing that I do. Because I know as a parent, um, we don't want to be bombarded with 40 minutes of something that I have to be able to do while also cook dinner and manage my home. And especially for students that have more complex communication needs and our emergent literacy learners. So if you have any additional questions that maybe we didn't get to in the Slack, please reach out to us. Um, you have our information on social media that you can get to us. Um, and we are left with maybe just a few minutes here if there's um, no other questions that we didn't get to in the Slack here. Alyssa just shared, Alyssa Wern is a fantastic resource. She has a um, comprehensive literacy book study group on Facebook. I'm glad, thank you for sharing that. It is a amazing group. There's a lot of like-minded professionals, parents, um, everybody's in there and just really troubleshooting some of these things, um, you know, that, that questions that people might have as they're coming up. Um, just amazing minds in that group. So yes, definitely run over there and check that out. Yeah. Any other questions? I don't know. I think we're okay here. Thank you for your participation in the Slack today. There was a lot of great ideas shared and um, it's incredibly valuable for us as educators to get examples from other parents as well too. So thank you. Well, thank you both Ashley and Lauren. You're such a dynamic team and all the explicit ideas that you have and the resources and step by step, I think we'll all go away with just loaded with ideas and sharing ideas. The nice thing about Slack is they're all still there for everyone to access. So thank you again and have a wonderful rest of your conference. Everyone.